Welcome to Classic Burners. On this podcast, we will be going over some legendary L.A. burners with none other than the old school master, Risky, from the West Coast Artists. So hop on board and don't miss the bus. All right, here we are. Welcome to Classic Burners. Risky, I mean, he's well-known, well-documented. He's There's a lot of his current stuff you can check out on his Instagram and his website and all that. These are the pieces we're going to talk about that help build his reputation, help establish him as a style master. Um, they help push uh, as an inspirational figure to help push the envelope and, and help the city uh, develop uh, style. And so with that being said, um, we're going to start off with going into the first uh, yard really that was like, an, I, I believe it was the first West Coast artist yeah. yard. And give us a little a little breakdown on that. Yeah, so the West Coast tracks, West Coast Yard, I mean, that was the first yard as I knew, but I mean, later I found out, I think Radiotron was probably the first yard, right? I think probably that the parking lot, if you want to call that a yard. But the West Coast tracks <coughs> started because uh, I went to Uni High, and that was just a little wall that we could get up on. And that track actually had a piece on it for Jane's Addiction. They all went to Uni High. Hmm. So Dave Navarro went to Uni High, and some of the dudes went to Uni High, and they're a garage band. So Crazy J did a piece that said Jane's Addiction on the on those tracks. Wow! And it was just a brick wall, you know, a cinder block wall, and it had this band, it was band shit, and Sautel. Sautel so what was style called. was it? Like metal letters? No, like a bubble. This is like before Punk like that letters. metal look was oh, even you know oh, a look, wow. right? <laughs> so it was like just some bubbly Jane's Addiction letters, right? And it was like just really early, early graffiti. Um, and that was on that thing and we all knew about it and those guys were like really really early Crazy J and uh, uh, oh, I forget what his name man. Uh, he wrote Yaz but I forget what he wrote but he um, they bought me in your high like, like in 80 82 or something right and they, they quit by 83 we started in 83 and they were they were done and we didn't know who they were or anything I met them years later and we hung out a lot and they started painting again but they did this piece, so we would go down there and we'd see all this shit. It was like Sautel had the whole tracks with all their blocks and gang writing and shit. And they had that one Jane's Addiction piece. And then we were like, man, we should paint here. So me, uh, uh, Legit, and Pressy started painting there. They were from Sautel, and they were from from uh, uni, and they were in WCA. We started painting that track, and we were doing it at night, illegally. And then we kind of figured if you, the wall bent a little bit so I kind of figured if I go all the way to the end of the wall I don't think anyone could really see me and there was a big building here it was a, a, a like a warehouse or something and yeah, if you got the hours right you could go when all the cars are parked there so they couldn't see you so we started hitting it and when we started getting colored pieces on it and graffiti was really new at the time people were like wow what's that and they liked it and they were cool with it so the, all the businesses around there were cool but there was a, a truck yard on the other side of the fence and they just don't hit these trucks and we're like, yeah, cool. And we never hit the trucks, but the gangs used to hit the trucks. People mm. don't even know. Gangs were getting up on trucks like way before like graffiti and taggers, you know? Yeah. But uh, they knew the difference and they were cool with us. So that's how it started. So that, that yard just became crazy and it just became like they had dudes come up from um, San Diego, like Severe and Czar and all those dudes rolled up because they heard about the yard and Can Control started, you know, ghetto art at the time, started posting it uh, or putting it in the magazines and then um, it got like, to be a yard okay cool yeah and, and so from my my point of view when i saw it yeah. me and dash 2000 used to in um, 1986 used to kind of like go out and look for places to take pics and yeah. we were hunting graffiti we were yeah. younger and that was one of the places that we ran into um and what was really cool was that when we we got there the first time stuff was written on a bit yeah. but then as i would go back a few other times man i got to catch like um so the first time we went, and I'm going to put put the pics up, yeah. there were some silvers that you guys did that were just silver and black, super simple. Yeah. It said just a little risk, a whisk, and a minor. Yeah. And, and those were like super clean and simple. But they made such an impact in my brain that that inspires me to this day. Like that's where my simple letters are based off of. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was like the format that I learned. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we went back you guys started really taking it up a notch and really getting into the colors, the wild styles and all that. And there was some really, really tight burners. And I believe yeah. that LA's technique went up a notch through that because from there, from what you guys did, 
I saw that other like KSN and other crews and other yeah. people started following those formats, you know, and some of the clean lines and some of the different stuff that you guys yeah. are doing, fades, techniques, certain yeah. tag styles, whatnot. Um, so that's how we saw it, you know, just from another, you know, yeah. another point of view. Um, how did it end? Uh, you know, the yard got burnt out. You know, it's just got to be like so crazy. Animal lumber. You know, we started going doing blocks. We buff the whole yard because we were trying to hold it down as mm. West Coast tracks and you get out of control. We'd buff the whole yard and just put hollow outlines across the whole thing and roll calls. And and then um, KSN started coming, Rev and Rise did their first pieces there. And, um, you know, we were trying to hold it down. I, I you know, I was a knucklehead back then, so I started painting Anawalt. I wore on the street side illegal at night <laughs> so you could see it, and that burnt the yard out. Mm. And then uh, they had some gang activity. Uh, I think some posers came through looking for some Venice dudes because a lot of us used to hang out there. And then it just kind of got burnt out, you know. And then people started hitting those trucks I was talking about. They moved the truck yard, so it kind of regenerated the, the yard again. But then it just got burnt out. Uh, so let's take it now to another pioneering, awesome thing that went down, which was a sounds good stereo wall, which was actually not far from where, where this studio is right now. I think it's somewhere over here. Yeah. It was right yeah. in Topanga or something. Um, that was a le legit wall, but it was done totally graffiti. There was no mural, nothing. It was yeah. letters and characters, but it was the, so it looked really, really hot because it was just like a production burners and that i believe was the one of the first and biggest nice productions that was well put together in my opinion yeah that i saw yeah it's and well, yeah. so uh why don't you please tell us how that came about and some of the stories behind sounds good stereo yeah well to me that was the first production and the biggest wall we had at the time in la like someone said i don't know how many stories it was three stories or four so i don't know what it was but like at the time, it was fucking huge. Yeah. So we're like, oh, shit, we got this whole wall. They go, do whatever you want. Just make it say sounds good stereo. So I did pieces, just sounds good stereo. Um, and then uh, Blinky, Genius, Dante, me. Um, and we did these pieces, and we had big speakers. Blinky did the truck. That uh, was Genius. classic. It was like a 59 Chevy yeah. or something. 57 yeah. 57 Chevy. 54, maybe. 54. Uh, yeah. I don't know, something, but it was really classic looking. Yeah. Speaking of that truck, I love. he did that one red, and I got a, a black one. I still have it. Fresh. And I, that's the truck I always remember. I was like, I'm going to get one of those. But um, And then we had the speakers on there, and I did the speakers for my O's for the Sounds Good Stereo. Yep, I remember that. And I did a wrist piece with a heart, and it was busted out. And... um. We just tripped out because we didn't know anything at, you know, now you see all these huge productions and murals and stuff like that. We didn't know anything about that shit. Now, I don't think we had a lift or anything. I think we had like ladders or so. I don't know what we did. You used know? all spray paint too. No all colored spray buff. Paint, nothing, no right? buff, like the whole <laughs> fucking shit. And then uh, <laughs> it was just the biggest production. People came from all around. Funny thing about that wall is Danny Boy from House of Pain still has a sketch. Wow. And he goes, yeah, he came and he grabs it off the ground. He has it framed. I'm like, let me get that. And he never lets me get it. Fresh. I want it. But um, he has that sketch. But uh, that that was a big turning point because for us, it was like, oh, shit, we could do anything. The sky's the limit, you know? And um, it was just cool. And especially, like, uh, planning out something of that scale. And this all sounds so funny now. But the simple simplicity of, like, planning out, like, I'm going to do big letters across the top, and then we're going to do a character of the truck with the speakers, and then we're all do burners on the bottom. It's such a elementary like yeah. concept, yeah. but that was the first, right? Yeah. So you know, you know, after that, there's a million walls like that. Yeah. But back then, that was like the first kind of diagram for a uh, for a production. It definitely set the yeah. standard. It put the bar up, and um, so from me having this feeling and experiencing this, a lot of other pieces are going to relate to this. When you rock a, a, a production or a piece like that. As you walk away that that evening or whatever, and you take your pick, whatever you you could just sit there and stare at it and enjoy it. You know what I mean? And you know, like, yeah, I rocked, I burned that. You know, and it's yeah. dope, dude. Tell, describe how you felt after you walked when you did that, bro. You know, it's weird for me because I was I was weird, bro. Like I used to get a lot of photos later, but I kind of didn't get a lot of photos Ooh. too. So I kind of like went through these stages where I didn't get shit, and Ooh. then I'd go searching for my shit and get a bunch of photos. And, you know, I was that dude that used to lose a lot of shit, you know, like, uh, you know, but this is years later, right? I had all my stuff get, I got evicted out of studios and stuff like that. I used to lose a lot of shit. But 
I never really paid attention because we had people like Charlie and Power and those dudes getting all the photos. Yeah, they were like big photo guys. So I was like, they yeah. can take better photos than I'll ever take. So if I ever mm -hmm. need it, I could go to those guys. Yeah. So I, I didn't get my photos till, the point of this is I didn't get my photos till later. So I do the pieces and I have to wait for them to fucking publish them or whatever to get the photos. But I remember after I did that thing, man, I was like always straight up onto the next. Mm. But the thing was, I was like, oh, that was cool. How can we go bigger and better? So because of Sounds Good Stereo, I was like, that was cool. How can we do it without saying Sounds Good Stereo? You know, mm -hmm. that was like the mindset, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, you were driven. Yeah. All right, which takes us to the next natural progression <laughs> in, the, in the story. Uh, maybe a year after 1987, there is a a situation where an, an OG writer from like the Harbor area named Clever, who was instrumental and in, he was kind of a unifying guy that helped bring together a lot of writers and, and start some crews up and stuff. A very respected guy, Danny Bonner, rest in peace, um, had passed away. And um, there was a big wall on Crenshaw right on the strip that eventually they had kind of some kind of so-so murals on it and eventually there were some memorials put up for uh, De Clever, Danny Bonner um, and uh, I remember passing by when those first went up took the pics and then as I would pass through there suddenly I start seeing like big productions from uh, you, from Dream, from Green and that wall became like the best wall in LA hands down. Yeah. Hands down. Dude. There was yeah. nothing that could burn those pieces. Yeah. So I want you to go ahead and tell us a story Talk to us about um, about the Crenshaw Wall from the beginning, the experience, how you came about it, the whole nine. So, you know, Clever, about that time, we were really heavy on the Pan Pacific Auditorium. We were bombing the fuck out of that place. like, And it was like they couldn't control it. They couldn't stop us. They had a, a security guard that lived in a trailer, and he couldn't do shit. And, he, and when you go back and get pictures, talking about pictures the next day, I get pictures... And we just kind of laugh at the guy, and he'd be like, "Hey, man, you guys gonna get me fired?" And we're like, "We don't know what you're talking about." And he's like, "Let's make a deal." He goes, uh, "I'll let you paint, just don't put any bad words and this, that." And it's like, "Cause I'm gonna tell my boss that I'm en encouraging kids, cause you're gonna get me fired. Like, this is fucked up." Cause he'd sit here, and someone would whistle, and we'd be over here, and he'd come here, and we, you know, it's a cat and mouse thing, and we're killing that building. So the reason I bring up that building is because one day we get to the the building. And it says, graffiti will be with me forever, Clever. Clever had bombed the building that night. Oh. And we looked at it, and he had this nice tag style that was like these like real simple letters. And uh, we're like, oh, fucking Clever, check it out. Graffiti will be forever, Clever. Da, da, da. And then we hear the news right then that he got shot wow. at the Crenshaw Wall. Not, we didn't know it was the Crenshaw Wall yet. He got shot on Crenshaw. And we're like, what the fuck happened? And supposedly he was in a red car. And you know what was going on at that time with red and blue and all these crips and bloods. And supposedly he got shot in, in his car uh, over there. So we go over there to check it out, you know. We want to see it. And, uh, you know, it was our friend. We wanted to, I don't know what we were doing, what we were going through at the time, but we went over there. And we're checking out. We saw that wall. We were like, man, we fucking shit that fucking wall put up for Clever, you know. And they had murals on the wall. So they had like some, um, you know, school activity murals or neighborhood murals, or whatever it was with a brush and, you know, stuff like that. Neighborhood pride stuff, whatever it was. And uh, we didn't do it or anything, but eventually drifting on a memory, right? I think they did that wall. Mark 7, KMC, yeah. Sphere and Flame. Yeah, and then we eventually got to do a memorial wall over there. Um, I think Rest in Peace or Rest in Paradise or whatever it said. And... and that wall started becoming really hot, not in a in a in a hot way as in dangerous, or like hot meaning like it was happening because it was getting so much publicity in videos and movies, right? I think you had Boys in the Hood or something, and Crenshaw, and they had all those scenes with the, all the cars and people shooting and running, and and that wall is famous, and a lot of rappers hanging out. So we would start going up there, and on Sundays it was a fucking big spot, man. All the little cars would park there, like I say, little cars because I think it was like. Samurai, Suzuki's, and, and Mustangs were hot at the time or something, you know, and they're all parked up there and booming stereos and everything. We'd walk around. And, uh, you know, Green, Dream, Charlie, myself, eventually were like, we wanted to hit that wall. 
And we figured out some way to do it or something. I think we parked some cars and we did some low pieces or something. And you know how it was back then. Once someone got a little scratch on it, it was still like that, right? Once someone got a little scratch on it. So I think they caught us doing it or something. And they're like, hey, man, don't mess up this mural, but you can have this section. And we did some section. We fucking burned, right? I think it was cartoon in me. I think that the first one, it said uh, West Coast. And we did a sort of piece on the yeah. bottom. And uh, he did these little funky little characters, and he ended up smoking a big joint, which that is kind of funny. Yeah. And um, that piece was a burner. It's like one of my favorite pieces, right? And uh, all the fucking neighborhood, all the hood came out there, loved it. Everyone loved it. And we did it very neutral, bro. It was greens and yellows. We didn't use reds and blues. We did it very fucking conscious. But what was cool about it is that, and this is always something that you were very good at, and you were the best at it, in my opinion, was what I call Cali colors. Yeah. Because you took like a lot of the colors that were from the 80s, like on clothes and stuff like that, like the light green, the yeah. sea foam greens, sea the pastel foam, aqua Pastel type, aqua, yeah. And some of the, the, the bright like neon oranges and different yeah. things. And you would, you would, you, yeah, you knew how to contrast them really yeah. well. And make some really colorful pieces, man. And that production, yeah. which we will put on the um, on the thing, yeah. on the screen, it, it, it's definitely had that beautiful, beautiful coloring, bro. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah. But that was the, that was the thing to us. You know, it was important and this and that. So we did that, and then from that, we kind of just grew. So we started really busting out stuff. And then Slick and I were doing aerosolics, and we started doing some burners up burners. there. Like some Slick's characters were just like so next level. Like it was like, you know. Again, when you, we talk about this, people are like, what are you talking about? Like, there was no shading back then. Like, Slick's characters looked like an airbrush, you whatever, whatever. And he could do whatever he could do with an airbrush with a, with a spray can. And they were just next level. Three-dimensional Three as opposed dimensional, to the usual old two-dimensional. Beyond, yeah. you know? And he would do the characters. I was doing letters, and I had good letters. And, you know, we were this dynamic duo, and we went around, and, you know, we went, we won the world championship. You know, we went to London. We're going to talk that about that. We're definitely uh, going to talk about so, that. We were doing these productions, and we, we we would push each other. We were our, our biggest critics were slick and me criticizing each other, but loving to paint with each other, you know. And we would laugh about it and joke too. But so we started doing those pieces. We did to live and die in L.A. Um, speaking of, yeah, this is funny. We did to live and die in L.A. and ghetto art. IGT Times saw it. Phase two, Vulcan. They saw the wall. They called us and said, "Hey." We want you to represent the United States and go to that battle in London, and that's how that happened. But anyway, so we started doing that, and then uh, so I think Green and Dream were talking to Ice T, and he was at the wall. He's like, oh, "You should put some my shit up here," and they did Ryan Pays, you know. And then the wall just it was like a legacy wall, bro. It was just like burner after burner after legendary thing after legendary thing. And you, you know? know, for the viewers, just to give you a little context on how live this wall was, first of all. The Crenshaw Strip at the time was a cruising spot where young people on weekends would cruise their cars with sounds up and down there and just partying, mingling, meeting. And the wall was huge. It was long. And it had its own little street, side street. Yeah. Like, so it had a little island with a few palm trees or something in the middle. And then so you could just park there that was a turn and pull out. over. And, and, like, and it was out. like, yeah. and you had to be like the best of the best to get that little spot. Yeah, so all yeah. the dudes that were like, you know, doing the most Only top notch the, were right yeah, there because yeah. they could pull over right there and they sit on the cars and you watch people go by and whistle and yeah, whatever, you yeah. know. Oh, it was that, but that, that wall was crazy. And you know, it, it had its share. You know, people thought I was nuts over there because I didn't fit in over there at all. People were like, What's the fuck this dude doing? But uh, you know, it got really crazy at night over there. You know, there's was, was heavy, heavy activity over there. Um, and eventually, you know, the wall just got to be out of control, like yeah. everything. and that was the end of that, you know. Was there any times where, like, uh, some of the gang banging spilled over to you guys? And always, just, always, always. But you know, the, it was a blessing, right? Because I didn't fit in. I was this little white boy over there, and they'd rush up, like, and then they'd see me, and they knew immediately I wasn't from the neighborhood, their neighborhood. Yeah, that, yeah. that wasn't a crip or a blood. Yeah. And they were immediately kind of like, "Oh, what's going on?" Yeah. And they talk shit or something, and sometimes they'd laugh, and then eventually they knew us, and they're like, "Oh, that's fucking risky, whatever." And they mm. they were cool. Uh, and I think I probably helped out a little bit because if I wasn't there, probably they were just. They might have really got on these guys. Yeah, yeah, they would have rushed them really quick, but they I threw them off a little bit. You yeah, know? yeah. But um, you know, and then you know, they people tried to control. You can't control graffiti, 
and people tried to control it. They're, you know, the, 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 God bless their hearts, but they'd come say, hey, man, you guys can't paint here. We want you to come paint this building. And it's just not the same. Yeah. You know, and we didn't want to do it. We didn't care. Yeah. You know, Once the city get, kind of got wind of it, they wanted to control it. Yeah. 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 And, and that eventually, it, it ran for a long time, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then eventually, it was illegal for a long time, mm-hmm. and it ran, and we just it got tagged. We go fix it, yeah. And you know, we take us five minutes to fix it, so we'd be gone by the time someone would show up, you know. Yeah, but eventually, what was cool, just on a, on a side note for people that were wondering what happened to that wall, eventually, I think some writers, as they got older and were able to actually get into positions of uh, influence with the city, yeah. actually ended up getting it to be a legit wall. And yeah. So now it's got like a good production by Does writers, it? yeah. I, I or at, last, at, at one point, yeah. they had. I uh, actually got paid to piece it up properly. Nice. End to end. So, it, it, yeah. I'm going to go see it, All man. the RTNs, man. I, Shout out to RTN. I forgot down, about, like, that's, you know, I go check on a lot of spots. I go to my West Coast tracks and I like, see all the walls chopped down and torn up, and broken half and everything. Yeah. But I haven't gone there in a long time. I'm going to go check it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and move on um, to the next uh, episode, which was the battle. I mean, the, the, yeah, the international battle, bro. This is, we're talking about the Olympics for graffiti. Yeah. We're talking about a trophy, the old school big gold cups <laughs> yeah. type of trophy. Yeah, man. Tell us all about that one, bro. So it was crazy. So they, so Slick and I thought they were full of shit, right? What are you talking about? And I'm like, Slick, they said they're going to send us to fucking England. And we're like, what? Let's go. Let's burn these motherfuckers. We were cocky, too. We were fucking LA'd out like to the max cocky. You guys knew. Yeah. You guys, you guys knew what you were doing was... Yeah. And we were... You know, this is, that's just the, this is the battle era. Mm-hmm. This is when yeah. like, fuck era. Let's yeah. battle. You know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. And um, so we went to London and we met all these dudes and we came in like dicks. Like <laughs> we came in like fucking just like everyone... This is when we realized where we lived and how we grew up. We're in LA and it's a hostile place, and you know, survival of the fittest, all that shit. And we just figured everything's like that. And we heard stories about New York, supposedly like that, right? Yeah, so right. everyone thinks must be like that. Yeah. And we get out there, and all these dudes are peace, love, and happy. It's, hey, man, how are you Ooh. doing, brother? We're like, slapping their books out their hands and shit, <laughs> you know, just doing dumbass shit. And then they take this thing, and they go, We were in the town called Bridlington, and it's on the water, and it's like a real old school town. And they, Take this thing that goes, there's going to be 5,000 people here watching this. This is an honor to paint here. Please don't tag the city. This is not that kind of city. Please don't write. Da, 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 da. So all the shit they're saying, me and looking at We go that night, like I think it was an auditorium. We do an illegal piece that says USA, and it has Uncle Sam. Oh. And we write Ego Busters. And like we don't know what egos. We're talking shit to everybody. Wow. And then looking back, we were the only ones. Everyone's like, so the next day for the orientation, they're like, so... And they're just pointing to the wall. They're like, well, this is what we're kind of talking about. We don't want to do it, you know. But we set the stage. So everyone's like, damn, these dudes came hard, you know. Get Up Stickers is the ultimate bombing sticker. Made from military-grade materials, these stickers are super easy to peel and were made for putting on tanks. So you know they're going to last. So click on the link below to submit your designs. You don't want to sleep on this. So, you know, I met a lot of people there that I'm still good friends with, you know, like Bates. Uh, I've visited him and traveled with him and and painted in multiple countries with him, Uh, done multiple projects. He still visits me at my house. Remy Ruff, um, John Wood. I met all these dudes there in this setting. And, you know, Slick and I went there. Uh, Volcan, who's a great friend, you know, we became friends. And that was awkward because he was from New York and he was a judge. And we're like, we're definitely not going to get fucking picked because we're from L.A. And like... uh, you know, and we met him, and he became a great friend after. And um, we got our shit together because we went there kind of like with the the LA attitude. We're here to battle. We're here to burn. Fuck everybody. We're the best. Fuck the rest. That whole shit. And then we realized these dudes are all real artists, and they're all about the art form and elevating and elevating each other. And blah, blah, blah. so we we got our shit together. We learned a lot, and it changed us. I think. Okay, but let's talk about now, let's dig a little deeper and talk about the actual competition. So we'll let, on the visual note, mm-hmm. um, I want to know, first of all, your strategy, how you, what they were coming with. Did you wait and then hit them later? Did you just come full out attack? Well, And how different was your style from theirs? Yeah, so the strategy was straight up, we're going to have Slick just be dominate with characters everywhere. 
just do his do slick and I was going to do some letters keep it simple whatever 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 but what happened was <laughs> uh, these dudes had plans well Ooh. thought out we're like wow these dudes are nuts right we just we freestyle everything we never have outlines we never we, we freestyle everything but that was our plan we get there it's raining the wood's all fucked up we have to build our own panels we have less time to do it it looks like I can't paint on this shit it was too slicky, slick and whatever 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 so we had to improvise so I had to wind up just doing a burner I did a burner on the whole thing a risk burner and he did some little characters in between the caps and shit and did the fucking razzle dazzle on it and everything but we just had to improvise so I did this thing and I, I did the the what was later known as the inside border and that shit was like that was hot that was hot because no one mm-hmm. now it's like every piece in the world pretty much has that yeah, you know yeah. but back then no one had an inside border and people I always ask where that's from I said it's from lowriders I'm just trying I was trying to do lowrider patterns mm. and that's what that was and people yeah. translated it into inside border mm. and I was just trying to do lowrider patterns so we did a wrist piece and then I think I don't even remember what he did He did. I think he did a, a mask do the yeah, mask like one of his 3D characters yeah, with the you know, mask he kills it with the, yeah. the glass and all that stuff and I remember he had a spray cap that was mm-hmm. you know it's classic yeah, spray yeah. Cap, but he had the lightning out of the spray cap yeah and um, we won you know a lot of people were giving up they couldn't paint they were the differences between styles yeah um, so they had people there trying to do realistic stuff which they're lucky they didn't because Slick would have burned them but you know, it was too damp out. Went out to really do that kind of stuff, so we had to change up the strategy. So we did straight burners, and we won. And John won won the single man competition, and he did some wild ass shit. So John won. I think, if I remember correctly, brought a suitcase full of paintings and sketches. And he's like, "Yeah, man, this is like a year's worth of work," and he fucking started pasting that shit all over the shit. Wow! And then he started connecting and painting on top of. It. He did some like crazy art shit, you know. And we're like, damn. It's, you know, like He spent a year on this thing. Mm. And he's like, whatever. He wanted to win real he was, bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was cool, man. Um, <laughs> he was out there. He was cool. But um, that was it, man. We so, just, we, and you know, we pulled it together. We, how was the presentation of the trophy? And all, Was there a ceremony? Was oh, there a yeah. party? Well, so how the, did it go down? So there's 5,000 people there, and it's, it's in this town for a weekend. And Swatch Watch, I think was the sponsor back then. Mm-hmm. Swatch Watch. They were big. They were and they had a huge skate ramp, and they had some break dancers, and they had some rappers, and they had bands and everything. And so they're uh, in the ceremony, they go, and the winners from Los Angeles. And I was like, whoa, it's risky and slick. And then they're like, go. And I think, I don't know if. Slick made me go up, or someone pushed each other. Whatever, we went and got the trophy, and we were just not trying to talk to five thousand people. We were like, thank you. When you turn around, and walked away, you know. But was, the, but they took a really dope photo and put it in the newspaper, right? Oh, and it has you guys like holding the trophy and stuff. Oh yeah, well BBC BBC did a, a whole special on it, so this, they did a whole show on it, and then it was on the news there. Oh, that shit was wild. So every night the news was following us around. So different <laughs> countries had different stations following them and we had BBC following us and um, we at the hotel they had like girls would come out of the hotel and they'd go Americans Americans and they'd scream to us and we'd come out and shit like it was fucking wild <laughs> were, so that was your first t- taste of being a rock star right yeah bro it was crazy because <laughs> this town I don't even think they knew what we were doing they just knew that there was cameras on us and we were from America and then you know, and then the dudes we had, they had to give us a security guard because I guess we were pissing off all the local dudes. And we were, it didn't help that Slick was a, a dressed really cool, like Hollywood style. He had like a beret and a yeah. bombed up jacket, and he cool had a taxi guy. hat. Yeah, and his biker pants with a bombed uh, leather yeah, jacket. He, he, yeah. And we were going to all the bars, and the girls were you know liking us, and the locals didn't like it. They started throwing glasses at us. Oof, yeah. You know, it was crazy. <laughs> well, nuts. Okay, so that that so that's cool. So man, we were proud of you guys. Just so you know, man, yeah. you guys held us down in the U.S. And that's one thing that I'm grateful for. Um, having elders like West Coast artists, you rival and, uh, that I knew, and then on the K2S side, having Prime and Rick and all them guys, I felt like L.A. We have enough talent and dudes that that hit it hard yeah that we could hold our own against the world yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. like that's what you for us younger writers provided for us a feeling of security of like we have a culture here you yeah know, it's solid and that we can if someone wants to battle and go toe-to-toe we got 
dudes that can hand, uh, yeah. proudly represent us you yeah. know, properly. Yeah. So that so thank you for that. Um, Want to definitely go now into the next um, phase, which was now we're getting to the '90s. And gangster rap comes in, right? Yeah. Uh, after Ice T, you know, he helped. He he, he kicked that door down, yeah. and then pretty soon you had N.W.A. Then Ice Cube went solo, and one of his solo offerings was one of his big ones, where where the company really wanted to put some money into it, and, and on that album on that single, it was called "Who's the Mac." Okay, and they filmed a video in which it took place in the motor yard, right? Yeah. And you guys did a production yeah. at the yard. So this was like crazy. Um, and <coughs> it, it blew my mind of like, how the hell did Risky get these fools to drag all their equipment? Because from the motor yard, from the street to where these guys did the production, it's a long walk through rocks, yeah. tracks, uh, holes, ponds, like... <laughs> So, dude, tell us the whole story about that, bro. Well, we were just like, you know, we, you know, our whole thing is we're, you want to keep it real, right? Mm -hmm. Ice Cube, you want to keep it real? This is real, motherfucker. Let's do it. You know, and, and you know, he wasn't going to back down. So he's like, whatever. And we're like, you know, place is dangerous. People get shot there. People, whatever. whatever. So it was kind of like he was like, what? <laughs> I'm bringing my dudes. What's up? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, Slick hooked up the, 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 I think, the preliminary, like, presentation to them. And he got it. It was all his thing with them and then um we started doing it so he said yeah i want you to do some who's a mac letters here and he did this crazy mac uh, pimp character and he did the the flyer and he did the flag and all this stuff and this is all stuff that we wanted to do so it was like the best gig ever you know and slick was doing gigs at the time so i think he was doing a bunch of stuff i don't know what he's doing maybe booyah i don't know he's doing a bunch of stuff at the time, but he's right in that zone and i wanted to do a burner right and i remember i did my piece there i did with the water drips inside of it yeah it's like the first time i did that look that i do now all the water drips and stuff i did that for that piece mm. people are like well, how did you get that fill in and it was like the water drip fill in mm -hmm. i'll never forget ice cube and i saw him a few times and he always said like i was like he's like and i put his whole crew up and little letters. The Lynch Mob. Yeah, and Lynch that. Mob. We had D and this and that. And everybody that was there yeah. had their name in a little letter somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ice Cube's like, what the fuck, why my name ain't like that? Because mine was ah. all big and said risk, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I did that before, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys did a portrait of him on a wanted yeah. poster. That was cool. Yeah. But he was always like, you know, why my name ain't that big? Ah. <laughs> He was cool. Well, yeah, you know he's got to he's got to give he you guys a hard though. time. He, they were all funny. They were all cool as fuck, and they're, they're all, all tripping out. You know, the hardest thing with that kind of stuff is like, you know, when they come there to film, you, you not let them have the cans. You yeah. know, let, let me try. I'm like, oh, ah, yeah. I'll yeah. chill. You know. So when you guys did the piece, were, were a lot of them watching, or is it just the camera crew? And then later on, they filmed the video. They filmed the video later. Yeah, we did I the piece. That. We right. we did it a couple of days prior. Prior. But we right. were there when they filmed. You know. But yeah, we were there before. Yeah, because I imagine know. they're not going to have all their stuff just to film the mural. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, and then who documented that? Because there was good pictures of that. I don't know if it was Charlie or or uh, Charlie or Power. I don't know okay. who did. Okay, But they had great pictures of that, man. I think uh, I think it was the cover of Can Control one time or something. All right, let's see if we can get a hold of that one to yeah. put, put up. And you guys, you know, as we're talking, you probably would have already seen it post-editing, right? So If it's not the cover, I think it's definitely in there a centerfold. I don't think... At least the part where Slick did with Ice Cube is definitely a good photo in there. Yeah. I don't know if the whole wall is in there. All right. But it's like a whole page or two pages. Now let's go into freeways. Because from our point of view, from the L.A. writers, um, there was all the productions and stuff like that. But the cool part about you is that you also did a lot of bombing. Yeah. And so, um, especially on freeways, that was like your kingdom, right? Yeah. My memories were one of the first big ones that I saw was off of Mulholland, like under the 405, like there was an area right there, and there was a giant wrist, colorful that you did. Yeah. Um, so I want you to definitely describe that how you first got into freeways and that piece in particular. Yeah. And then also um, we're going to go into then when you really started going in 90 to 93 with when you started kind of rotating with, with like Charlie, with Dream. Yeah with um vin and, and yeah. it was different i yeah. even went one time you know yeah. i mean there was a bunch of yeah you were but you were out there killing regularly with different dudes and yeah. you were doing full color burners and mind you, the audience at this time up until then people were just doing like outlines hollows 
tags. Yeah. If no that. one was doing full color burners. Yeah. Dude. And then we're talking about with 3Ds, borders, full fills, highlights, the whole nine. So uh, let's go ahead and, and get into that. Starting at Mulholland and then take us up into the... Um, yeah. That. Yeah, man. So that's a, kind of a crazy thing. So I used to think a lot. You know, I was like a big thinker and you know, like com- competitive and stuff. And I was like, man... New York, you know, we don't have trains, right? So the first thing I did is we go to the Budweiser to paint their train, and I quickly realized it didn't give me the excitement I was looking for because it was not like a subway train. And subways had these big metal canvases putting these social comments across the city, and da, 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 and you could sit in one station and see a million of them, right? So I was like, fuck, man, we have freeways. We don't have anything like that. And then one night, I just go, freeways. It just hit me. I was like, fucking freeways. But I have to hit all of them. I can't, you know, I can't just hit. You know, I have to hit all of them. So I jumped up, and I ran out, and I hit a freeway. Or I think I hit the Sepulveda Boulevard first, right? And I was hitting right on the street. Like, and it was fucking crazy. And then I realized how easy it is to get away. By the time a cop sees me, they're usually always coming. I'm worried if they're coming on the same side as me. But if they're coming right at me, I don't care. Because by the time they turn around, I can run. And I realized how quick I could get away. And I started getting really, like... Fuck this! I I got this. You know, as long as I get most of the piece done, they ain't catching me. So I started doing that, and then I started realizing freeways. And then I was like, man, again, subways, colors, burners. I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but I got to do burners, got to do colors. So I started doing color. So that Mulholland spot was one of the first ones I did, and that was super early, bro. That was like '83, and it was it was before Risk. It was, I think I was Irock or Isrock. Something like that, and I think I went and changed it to Riz Rock. Later. Yeah, that was before me. I never even yeah. seen that. Yeah, that was I the, just saw that, the '86. That's risk. the first colored yeah. piece on a freeway, and that's when no one even tagging freeways. Mm-hmm. And then I started bombing freeways, and then I told my crew about it, and then they started bombing freeways, and we we're hitting like the ten freeways, rival, minor, minor was hit a, quite a few, I yeah. think. At the yeah. time. And then I was hitting freeways, and Miner's hitting freeways. We were separate places, and then I told Miner about the colored thing. He goes, "You did a color piece." Like, he says, where? Show me. So I took him to the spot to show him that colored mm-hmm. piece on Mulholland, and we did. We went over it that night. So I did. He did a minor block, and I did a risk or something. I did a risky block. Okay, I, rem- I remember. And it was those. color. Yeah. And um, he's like, that's crazy. Color pieces on the freeway. I'm like, yeah. And that was the birth of it. So I did the piece two years before that, but it never really got any play. And mm-hmm. It was kind of whack. But that was the birth, the first of it. Because when Miner and I hit that one freeway, and it was color. Mm-hmm. I mean, immediately. It wasn't like a couple of days or weeks later. The next day, we're out on another freeway hitting them. And then from that point on, it was just color. Mm-hmm. Or it was like silvers with the border or whatever, whatever, whatever. And it just changed the whole game. That's yeah. how it happened. And um, I was comfortable on freeways. And I went out to free. I lived on Ivar on Hollywood Boulevard, right? In that little studio, mm-hmm. whatever. And I would just you know, wake up at midnight or whatever it was and go out until daylight and I would hit freeways. I would just go out bombing. And that's what you said. I was with someone because it was like, whoever wants to come with me is coming and I would find somebody that wanted to go. So, you know, typical phone calls would go through until someone's like down, you know? And I went out every night. Every night of my life went out and I, you know, then I started getting one piece was enough. I had to do five. Then we went up to seven pieces one night, you know? And then I started doing everyone's name just in silvers you know got you know double well, digits you guys were and what was cool is that the guys you were with were also kind of really active at the time like especially char and dream right yeah so i remember when i went with you guys you guys were like really on each other like competing bro oh yeah you guys were bagging on each other oh. like riding each other and yeah like, like man i'm gonna burn you today yeah you guys had that kind of atmosphere going on. talk about that oh yeah well i, I used man we used to fuck with each other hard like i'd, <laughs> I'd like i was kind of a dick <laughs> <laughs> but I would like, I'd fuck with Dream so hard because, you know, he'd take his time and shit. So I'd do one piece right here. I said, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> and I'd do another piece right next to him. And I'm like, I just sandwiched you. You got sandwiched. <laughs> we were just talking dumb shit, you know? I go, you got sandwiched. Risk and risk. How's it feel? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we just said shit like that. And I remember Dream was so funny because he's like, man, fuck that. I'm not running because of the helicopters and shit. He was a big guy. So he used to go, go bring my box up there. Go bring my box up there on what box? He had a refrigerator box. And he goes, put my box up on the thing. We'll go burn tonight. And his thing is, like, if the cops come, I'm getting the refrigerator box. So, so he had a refrigerator box up there. And if the, the helicopter came, he was going to get in the box. You know, Whoa. I don't think it ever happened when we were with him, but that was always the plan. 
And I mean, I saw so much shit. People doing trash bags, trying to hide in the trash bag. People did all kinds of shit. I remember we climbed up with those little trees, and the helicopter would come to the trees doing this because mm. it's too skinny. Yeah. So we're like just flying all around, you know. And then uh, me and who got caught? Me and Charlie got arrested on the uh, the one ten one night, doing a fucking warehouse bomb ass spot right on the, on the thing. And Charlie said, "You should just come." Like, yeah, it's totally cool. They can't catch us. Whatever. And all of a sudden, the cops came. I was like, fuck, let's go. And we ran across the freeway, and they fucking came up the freeway off-ramp on traffic, like stars getting... Hurt. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> ran across, and then helicopters and cops everywhere. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And we kept running everywhere across the freeway, like back and forth, and there's helicopters and cars. I buried myself in these bushes. I'm covered. And then uh, I hear the dogs. And they're like, come out. Come out. We see you. And I'm like, I'm not moving. And like, we're letting the dogs out. And I'm like, fuck. So I jump out. And we found out they were staking out that warehouse because people were robbing it. So we just were just, just b- bad timing. Bad timing. Because yeah. I was like, dude, I've never seen cops like that before. Yeah. And of course, they weren't there. But it was like so funny because they uh, they got the pictures and we're in jail and the, the holding thing and they bring us out there and they take the pictures and they put it on and they go, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, mine's going to say, uh, take the risk, live life drug free. Wow, and that's I, some clever thing. And they go, bro. well, yeah, what's your buddy's going to say? Porn. And I go, oh, it's, he's going to say, stop show up pornography. I think his sister's molested or something. Wow. And they got all quiet. And they're like, uh. And they go, so they, we're back in the cell, and cop comes in and goes, hey, you know, I mean, I guess you guys are doing like a noble thing, but like you can't be doing that kind of shit. And this is still, cops are still kind of naive to graffiti back then, you know? And, um, where, I don't know what that area is over there by Frogtown, whatever that station is over there. But I remember fucking, they open up the thing, they they walk us out, and I don't know if they're taking us to count. I don't know what they're doing with this. And they open this door, and they kind of throw us out this back door and shut the door. Boy. And we're in a fucking neighborhood. Like, straight, I'm like, what the fuck? It's like a wall, literally. And you walk out, and you're in a neighborhood with houses. And the, on the other side, it's like a, the police station and shit. And I'm like, what just happened, Charlie? I don't know. I go, do, I get, do we get arrested? Go, they, yeah, they fingerprint us and everything. We didn't get any paperwork. You know, you guys. What they did is they just gave you a, a kick out and didn't didn't decide not to, to pursue the case. Yeah. So me and Charlie for like two weeks kept asking, "Do you hear anything? You hear anything?" We didn't know what it was because the cops were like they did yeah. it on purpose. They didn't tell us shit. So we're like, I guess we're good. Yeah. So we're like, don't say nothing. Fuck it. I don't know nothing. And so we didn't know for two weeks if we were arrested or not. We were like shitting, yeah, yeah. you know. But nothing happened, you know. No. But it, I told him that. That's what we were doing, and I guess you know they yeah. believed it or something. Well, yeah, that was before we understood how like the the system works, where yeah. DA has to file the yeah. the case and all yeah. that stuff. Now, now looking back, it's like, yeah, why would they waste their money on some yeah. little stuff like that, man? Um, okay, so so that was dope. You guys were rocking the freeways, tearing it up, and um, you know the, the the my favorite freeway piece, bro, and I still think it was the best freeway piece. Was the West Coast Kings? Yeah, I was going to mention that. That that was where the Tropicana was. Yeah, first it was of all, a, it was the main. Yeah, that was like the epitome of Hollywood. That it's was right it. there. Yeah, and it was illegal, pe- illegal, and it was as tall as I could fucking reach. Simple, clean ass letters, fully filled in, board double borders, and characters. Rev did characters in it, you know, and it was like West Coast Kings, right? Mm. And that crew was supposed to be. We had so much KSN WCA beef. And we're kind of friends, but enemies in graffiti. And it was so ugly between us on the walls, but cool with us with the music and all this punk rock scene and hanging out. So we tried to make it amends and get rid of both crews and make WCK. So it's West WCA and KSN, West Coast Kings. Yeah, I remember that. And I think it lasted about as long as that one mural. <laughs> like, you know, Well, you guys did do... Um, and this is also we're going to show some of these pics yeah. because these were some really good like burners, which was on the um, Fairfax. Yeah. Little yard, there's a little yard on Fairfax and La Brea. Yeah, it was just a little lot, small walls, but you yeah. guys really pushed the envelope with KSN combined. You guys yeah. did a lot of collaborations on there. Yeah, and so that goes in with that what you're talking yeah. about. So that that was the bomb, and then I remember like after that, I think it was uh, STN went up to the freeway during the day and started painting. That like big a, second and none. Second and yeah. none. Yeah. And they, I don't think they got to finish the cops came or anything, but they, I thought that shit was crazy. Yeah, yeah. But sure. that's, how it, that's how it started in L.A. People do illegal shit until it got to be like, people just said, fuck it, I'm going to do it during the day. Yeah. And sometimes it worked, but I guess mm-hmm. that one didn't work. Yeah. 
Okay. And then uh, speaking on this, let's just, the, the, the whole case, since you brought it up, the WCK, KSA, and all yeah. that stuff, because there's been someone has been kind of saying that, you know, they were making it seem like there was the beef was really bad and this and that. But it was kind of more like a friendly thing, like just to clear it up, right? Yeah, the beef was bad on the walls. But, you know, we were all, we hung out. I mean, we lived, I think some of us lived with each other. We were roommates and shit, I think. You know, I, mean, I think Kano lived in my studio for a while. He was KSN and, and you know, that house they had over there by Motor, I think there's WCAs and KSNs that lived in there. But they learned from Rival, right? They yeah. were like at Fairfax High, right? He yep. kind of brought them up in a way? Well, they went to Fairfax High. I don't know if they, 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 they learned from Rival. I think Rival was right there because Rev and Rise, their first pieces were at the Motor Yard. I was there the day they did them, right? And they were like, and they just came from a whole different world because Rival was, you know, in that world and he was down with punk rock and hardcore. But he also loved hip hop, you know, and they weren't about hip hop. They were about hardcore. You well, know? they were in a band called Excel, Excel yeah. a good band, yeah, very quality. And uh, but anyway, you know, we hung out. I mean, I hung out with a lot of those dudes. Like me and Dread were partners in bombing a lot. You know, we bombed a lot of shit together. Realm, all of them. So the beef wasn't. It was no bloodshed. It was just ugly on the walls, and it was kind of sad because you know we we can hang out and party all night, but we hate each other on the walls. That's weird. Yeah, man. <laughs> but it wasn't that we hate each other. We were just like we're the best. No, we're the best. We're the oh, best. No, I, we're the I best. No, you. you know. And we didn't hate each other. We were always cool. Just competitive, but more like super competitive. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like, you know, we wanted that title. You know, and it, it went back and forth. You know, we could do a piece, and they could do a better piece the next day. We could do a better piece the next day, and they could do a better piece the next day. Whoever's doing the last piece is going to be better. Got you. Because that's how we were growing at the time. Yeah, because you know? there was a lot of growth, a yeah. lot of that expansion at the time of uh, style. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, and um, and then Rise, if you're listening to this, because I, I reached out to him recently, yeah. so uh, I saw that's long ago. Okay, cool. So when you know when you uh, get a chance, try to make it out here. Let's get you on here so we can hear your side of the story. Because yeah. you know, so far we've won't, we've not really heard directly from you guys. I'd love to hear it. Chop it up with you, regardless, because you've earned your place in graffiti, LA graffiti history, and love to definitely you know chop it up about your styles, you know. And what and your accomplishments. Um, anyways, with that being said, you got any anything that you would less, like to share on your part? Uh, you know anything that? Uh, l- let me ask you this more. Than anything? What do you miss about those days? I miss Dream. Okay, that's my buddy, my brother. I love you, man. All right. Okay. Do you miss anything else about? I miss a lot of people, but right now I'm missing him. Oh, okay. All right. That's understandable. Dream, rest in peace respect um and with that being said do you have any last words for the viewers or for the writers of la uh keep on keeping on all right keep on keeping on that's a good i really like how you've been putting that up that's a, always an encouraging thing man right on all right thank you for coming by risky good time brother thank you we're gonna check out classic burners checking out thank you for watching peace out because time is our most precious resource, always remember that every minute, every second, every moment matters. So let's do our best to live a kind, compassionate, and loving life. And God willing, we'll see you in the next episode. Let's cancel the chatter off the grid, damage your scanner Set some light in this tavern and hold this mic just like a lantern I don't settle for the standard Or nestle in the pasture, turn a happy camper into a snack for a pack of panthers My pops would often reminisce on the mothership landed And then become sad in it, how the brothers disbanded Over money mismanaged and traditions abandoned
Get his rest.